assignment here from section two two is a little bit more thought provoking than perhaps the last one the last one was a little bit more routine these ones have some interesting approaches to working problems out now you're normally used to given be given a polynomial function for example if i give you the polynomial function f of x is equal to x squared minus 2x minus 3 and i ask for the zeros of this function you take the function, the rule, and you set it equal to zero. So you solve and find the x values that make this equal to zero. Those are the zero values. So I would have to factor this one. And fortunately, I picked one that factors, and that would set each of the factors equal to zero. And I would solve, uh, and I would find, in this case, subtract one, my two zeros. Right there they are. Well, in this case, you're doing the reverse. Here, let me make this a little bit bigger. That doesn't look very big right now. Let me, let me blow this up a little bit. There you go. That's a little bit better. Okay. So instead of starting with the equation and finding the zeros, we're going to reverse it. We're going to start with the zeros and find the equation. Now, this equation is only one of many that has these two guys as zeros because if I like multiply through by 2 or multiply through by 3 or any constant, multiply through by 10, by negative 10, um, I would still have the same two answers because that's not going to change the zeros. Okay? It's just going to kind of stretch, it's going to kind of stretch the graph out vertically and such, but that's not going to change the zeros because they correspond to the x-intercepts and they're not going to change if you stretch or shrink something vertically. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to have more than one possible answer. I'm just going to try to pick an easy answer. Now the good news is that for problem 53, they only gave us two zeros. Like here, I only had two zeros. And do you see how I had a quadratic? Degree two, two zeros, right? So I'm going to make, as, make this as simple as possible. And what I'm going to do is I am going to uh, uh, come up with a quadratic equation. Now. What you could kind of do if you wanted to is you could kind of work backward. You could say, all right, x equals 0, x equals 12, and then from here go to this. Well, of course, this, there's nothing really to bring to one side. It's just x equals 0, right? But this guy here, this would be x minus 12 equals 0. And then I could jump up to here that this is x from here and x minus 12 from here equal to 0. You see how this would go to that and this would go to that? And then I could distribute and I could write x squared minus 12x is equal to 0. And I could say that my function f of x is equal to x squared minus 12x. And that's one way you could do it. It's kind of an awkward way to do it, but that's one way you can do it. All right. The other way is that if there are zeros, when you set the polynomial equal to 0, they're going to be parts of factors. You see how the 0 kind of comes from here and the 12 kind of comes from here? Because this is like x minus 0. You just don't write it as x minus 0. So what you can do is you say, okay, I have these two. I'm going to do the problem all over again. I have these two numbers as zeros. That means that my function, I'm going right to the function here, is going to be x minus each one of these zeros, x minus 0 and x minus 12. And of course, x minus 0 is just x. So I get my function x squared minus 12x. And that's a good answer, as I got back here. And look, a lot less time. Okay, There's different approaches to it, but this is probably the most efficient way to go about to do this. Now, they say in the directions, there, there are many correct answers. Because, again, like I was saying back here, if I was to take this guy right here, and I'm not saying that you have to do this by any means, but if I was to multiply the right side through by any number, let's say I multiply through by 5, I would get f of x, is equal to 5x squared minus 60x. So if I look for the zeros here, I would set 5x squared minus 60x equal to 0. Factor out of 5x. Set each one of these things equal to 0. Divide by 5. Add 12. Do you see how I get the same two zeros? It didn't matter because all that constant did was become something that I divided by 0 into. I divided this 5 into 0, and that, of course, is 0. So you could have lots of different answers, but you might as well make it the simplest one here. Okay. Later on, they might make you do a little bit more. So let's try problem number 61. I think 61 is a little bit like this. Yes, it is. Now, 
There's another little trick here for problems like 61 that give you answers that are a little complicated looking. I say a little complicated looking because of the radicals in this case. And it's just not like it's the square root of 3 and negative square root of 3. It's 1 plus the square root of 3 and 1 minus the square root of 3, which are conjugates. These are called conjugates. You may remember that from before. Now, you could go ahead and do this approach where you just plug x minus this, x minus that in parentheses and then multiply. But you end up with something that looks like it has a, a trinomial times another trinomial, and that can get a little messy. So there is a nice little trick that you won't find in many textbooks, and I don't know if it's in this book or not. I didn't look. Let me see. Uh, <coughs> no. They don't show this little trick. And this only really works for quadratics when you only have two of them. You can get your function, all right, and it's going to be quadratic. It's going to be x squared minus the sum of the roots x plus the product of the roots or of the zeros. Yeah, I wrote roots. Let's write zeros do enough stuff to confuse you. You don't need to do that. And you can get the equation this way. So all you have to do is take the two zeros, add them, put it here, multiply them, put it here, boom, done. So if I take 1 plus the square root of 3 and I add 1 minus the square root of 3, I get 2. So that means my function f of x is equal to x squared. Now notice it's a minus here. So it's minus 2x. Now, if this had been a negative 2, then it would be minus negative 2x or plus 2x. And then it's plus the product. Now, how do you find the product of these two guys? Well, you kind of do a FOIL thing. 1 plus the square root of 3 times 1 minus the square root of 3. The good news is, because they're conjugates, the O and the I in FOIL will be opposites. They'll cancel out. So look, first, 1 times 1. Outer, 1 times minus square root of 3 is minus square root of 3. Inner, plus square root of 3 times 1 is plus square root of 3. And then last, plus square root of 3 times minus square root of 3. Well, positive times negative is negative, and square root of 3 times square root of 3 is 3. It's the square root of 9, which is 3. See how these cancel? So I end up with 1 minus 3, which is negative 2. So that goes right in here. So I'm going to have plus negative 2. Now that looks kind of silly to write plus negative 2. I would probably write my answer, not probably, I would definitely write my answer instead of plus negative 2, I'd just write minus 2. Now you'll have to memorize this because I doubt if you would ever put that for you on a, on a quiz or a test or at the top of like a worksheet or something for you to use. But that's a good one, but this only really works for quadratics when you only have two of them. If you have more than two, you got to go this route. Now, you say, well, what if I don't want to memorize this? Can I use this approach? Can I write f of x is equal to x minus this? Now, notice minus all of it. So in parentheses, 1 plus the square root of 3 and x minus all of this. So that's going to be in parentheses 1 minus the square root of 3. So this becomes x minus 1 minus the square root of 3. And this becomes x minus 1 plus the square root of 3. And see what I, I mean by you'd have to multiply. It looks like a trinomial times a trinomial because there's three parts, three terms. So if you did all of this work, and that's a lot of work, but that's x times x is x squared. That's x times minus 1 is minus x. That's x times plus the square root of 3 is plus x to the square root of 3. And then I multiply by minus 1. The minus 1 times x is minus x. Minus 1 times minus 1 is plus 1. Minus 1 times plus square root of 3 is, uh, where am I at? Minus the square root of 3. And then I got to multiply by the minus square root of 3. So minus square root of 3 times x is minus the square root, let me put the x first. Minus x times the square root of 3. Okay, minus square root of 3 times a minus 1 is plus the square root of 3. And minus square root of 3 times a plus square root of 3. So that's a negative times a positive. Square root of 3 times square root of 3 is 3. So that's going to be minus 3. 
Now let's see what happens here. This and this cancel out. Okay, this and this cancel out. So that gives me x squared. I have a minus x and a minus x is minus 2x. And I have a plus 1 and a minus 3, and that's a minus 2. Look, I got the same exact answer. But do you see how easy it would be to make a silly mistake with the sign? So you have to use this method. You got to be very careful. If you want to use this method, then you have to memorize this little trick here. The sum of the roots minus the sum of the roots plus the product of the roots. X squared minus the sum of the, of the uh, I keep saying roots, uh, the sum of the zeros X plus the product of the zeros. All right, so that's 53 and 61. That's probably more than you wanted to see on it. Well, let's jump to 65. 65. Let's see, in this case, they give you a function. This one doesn't look too bad. This is x to the third minus 9x. It says, uh, A, apply, uh, oh, you sketch the graph of the function by applying the leading coefficient test. All right, so in the leading coefficient test, this is odd degree and a positive lead coefficient, because it's a one there. Positive. 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 Man, I am drawing a blank. I can't remember how to spell positive. I'm pretty sure it's an I. Positive uh, lead coefficient. Yeah, it's an I. All right, so remember, I, I, we were looking at this earlier in this uh, on the uh, previous uh, video. When it's odd degree, one side goes up, one side goes down, When it because it's like a sideway S for a cubic. And so when it's positive, it goes up and to the right on the end. So it's going to do something like this. So it's going to uh, rise to the right, and it's going to fall to the left. Okay, so we're going to use that when we sketch it. Next thing, we're going to find the zeros. To find the zeros, I take x to the third minus 9x, and I set it equal to zero. And I solved this. Now, even though it's a cubic, it has a GCF of, <coughs> excuse me, of x. So that gives me x squared minus 9 if I factor out an x. And that's a difference of squares. So that's x minus 3 times x plus 3. Ah, those factoring. Key factoring facts. How to factor a difference of two squares into conjugate binomials there. Then I set the x equal to 0. I set the x minus 3 equal to 0. And I set the x plus 3 equal to 0. So this is solved. Here I add 3 to both sides. I get x equals 3. Here, <clears throat> I subtract 3 from both sides. I get x equals negative 3. So my zeros, which are going to help me find my x-intercepts, because the x-values of my zeros, or the x-values of the uh, these, these zeros, are the x-values of my x-intercepts. So 0, 3, and negative 3. Okay, and then let's see, part C, plotting sufficient solution points, and then D, drawing a continuous curve. So let's get some graph paper out here, and let's see if I can get all this on here. I think right now that fits. Let me grab a straight edge. Okay, now, I would suggest that you try graphing this on your calculator first, to see how high up and how, how low down it goes. Okay, I definitely have some symmetry here. You may have forgotten how to tell if something's symmetric to the origin, but this one is. Hopefully you can read this okay. There's one and there's one. So I have three points already. I have zero, zero, three, zero, and negative three, zero. Now, what I know about this kind of this function, it's cubic, it's a sideway S, and I know it rises to the right and falls to the left. So it's going to probably do something like this. Let me show you that again. It's going to go through here and then up and then down through the origin and then back up through here. So it's going to have a couple of turning points. It's going to have a relative max and a relative min. I don't know what they are, but I need some more points. These three points <coughs> not even coming close to what I need. So it's time to make a T-chart. X and Y. 
negative 4 would be good. Negative 2 and negative 1 would be good. 1 and 2 would be good. And 4 would be good. That's probably just about perfect. That would be the number of points. Now, the bad news is you got to plug them in to the function. Remember the function, it's off the screen there. It's uh, x to the third minus 9x. So if I plug negative 4 in, negative 4 to the third power is negative 64 minus 9 times negative 4, negative negative plus 36, negative 64 plus 36, negative 28. Yeah, that's going to be way off my graph. Unless I change the scale. Negative 2. Negative 2, that'd be negative 8 plus 18. That sounds like a 10. Negative 1, that'd be negative 1 plus 9, that'd be 8. Positive 1. 1 minus 9, 1 cubed minus 9 times 1. 1 minus 9 is negative 8. And then plug 2 in, you're going to maybe see some symmetry here. This should be a negative 10. Plug 2 in. That'd be positive 8 minus 18 is negative 10. Plug 4 in, that'd be uh, 64 minus 36 would be a positive 28. Okay, the negative 28 and the positive 28 just tell me that it's, it goes way down. Because I know it goes to this point, right? That was one of the zeros from here. And <clears throat> I know it goes through negative 2. 10, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, negative 1, negative 8, that'd be there, through 0, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, positive 1, negative 8, positive 2, negative 10, and then back through here. So what happens is it comes up, but it comes up steep because it's coming from negative 28. It comes up fast, goes through here, kind of comes back through here back around here, and then back through here. It goes up steeply. Now, you just want to take your time. You don't want to slop this down best you can. So I'm going to start by doing this part here. I'm going to go up like this. Now, the only way I'm going to be able to tell, you know, like does this go up higher than this point, or is this the, is this the relative maximum, is to get my calculator out and, and check it that way. Because I'm not wanting to plug a bunch of fractions in. And it comes through here, and then it comes back down here, through this part. Oops, see if I can draw it worth a darn. Something like that. That's kind of sloppy. I got it, should probably neaten that up here. Let me, here, I got a red pencil. Let's see if you can see it better with the red. Okay, and there's the graph there. Now, if I was to grab my calculator just to make sure what this looks like, let's see, let me turn it on. Let me hit Y equals, and I'm going to save that one for later, so let me go ahead and um, enter that in. Uh, what was this? This was X to the third. I, I use that one for later. This is x to the third uh, minus 9x. Okay, let's see what this looks like on my graph. I may have to reset the window. Oh, it didn't go in. Son of a gun. All right, let's try it again. x to the third. Got to guess a better look at the screen while I'm typing this stuff in. Minus 9x. All right, let's see what it looks like if I graph it. Now I have to change my window. Okay, here's my window. Let's now let's go to um, standard. Uh, yeah, standard six. Let's see what it looks like. Yeah, it looks pretty much like my uh, my graph right here. This is ten at the top. This is negative ten at the bottom. So see how it peaks up and bottoms out there. Not too bad. That's a good way to check it. Plus, it's always good to practice doing these kinds of problems using your graphing calculator. Use it for something other than a paperweight or a doorstop. Okay, so that's number 65. Next guy up, number 75. Now, this is more of the same here. Good thing I've got some more uh, paper for graphing. Here, let's start out with 75, kind of working it the same way. 
How are we doing for time? I'm going to have to hustle. I'm never going to get this done. 75 is f of x is equal to, well, let's bring it so you can see it here, is equal to x squared times the quantity x minus 4. Well, the good news is it's already factored. So I just said x squared times the quantity x minus 4 equal to 0. So I said x squared equal to 0. I said x minus 4 equal to 0. This means if I take the square root of both sides, that x equals 0. I mean, you can think of it as plus or minus 0, but it's still 0. And at 4, I get x equals 4. You say, well, wait a minute. If you distributed, you would have x to the third minus 4x squared. There's a 3 there. Shouldn't you have three zeros? Well, one of my zeros is repeated. It has multiplicity 2 because there's two factors of x here. This is x times x, right? I could think of this as x times x at each x equal to 0. So I have a double root there or a double or uh, multiplicity 2. So there's my zeros. I think that's actually part B with the zeros. Part A, I have to talk a little bit about uh, what it looks like with based on its uh, a leading coefficient, and this is identical to the one we just did. It's a cubic, because I wrote it this way just to show you. It's a cubic, and it has a positive lead coefficient. So this thing goes, uh, rises to the right, falls to the left. Okay, so part A was the leading coefficient, part B is the zeros. Part C, I need to make a table with some more points. All right, let me put my table in here. Okay, let me get my, uh, my graph started over here. Let's see. Should have picked something with a grid already on it. Oh, that's kind of messy. Let's see if this is enough here. Let's say this is 1 and this is 1. So my zeros are 0 and 4. Can you see that? 0 and 4. So 0 and 1, 2, 3, 4. See, the zeros are also the x-coordinates of my x-intercepts. So I have these two x-intercepts. Now, because it's a cubic, it's probably going to look like this. But you say, well, wait a minute, how's it going to look like this if it only cuts through two places? Well, there's a little bit of a twist because of the, <coughs> of the zero having multiplicity two. So we're certainly going to want to plug in some points here. I'm going to plug in negative two, negative one, one, two, and three, and five. That should be enough because I want to get all the values on the left here to see what's going on here. And then I want to plug in one, two, and three in the middle. And then I want at least one on here, if not even six. So now let's move this back. I'm plugging it into here or in this form. It doesn't matter. Negative two squared is four times negative two minus four is negative six. Four times negative six is negative 24. Plug negative one in. Negative one squared is one. Negative one minus one is negative five. One times negative five is negative five. Plug one in. This is one times 1 minus 4, which is negative 3. 1 times negative 3 is negative 3. Plug 2 in. This would be 4. 2 squared is 4. 2 minus 4 is negative 2. 4 times negative 2 is negative 8. Plug 3 in. 3 squared is 9. 3 minus 4 is negative 1. 9 times negative 1 is negative 9. Oh, I almost hate to see what this one's going to be. Plug 5 in. 5 squared is 25 times 5 minus 4 is 1. 25 times 1, yeah, this is going to get big. So let's go back to my graph here. Uh, let's see, I may have to fold this piece of paper so you can see this on the screen at the same time as the ordered pairs. Here we go. So I'm going to graph. Now that's going to be too far down, and that's going to be too far up, but we'll use that for steepness. I'm going to graph negative 1, negative 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, negative 5. It goes through here. It goes through 1, negative 3. See what happens? It doesn't cut through. It turns around and comes back down because of the double root, the, the, the multiplicity 2 for the 0, 0. Uh -huh, 0, 0. 
All right, and then I plug in uh, 2, negative 8. That's 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. And then it comes, uh, no, no, we need one more. 3, negative 9. And then it comes back through here. And then it's 5, 25. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. This is 17, and that's not going to be tall enough. So it's going to be really steep. It's going to come down really really steep almost vertical it's going to go through this point it's going to come back through here now it doesn't just hit it and then spike down you got to curve it. it it turns away from the x-axis like that you still get the sideway s it's just been shifted down a little bit and then what ends up happening is this is super steep as well it goes all the way down to negative 24 and there's your graph right there. Now again, you get your calculator out. And let's let's see, let's get rid of, no, I want that one. Let's get rid of this one. And let's type in this, because this is just easier to type in that way. So if I go x to the third, here, x raised to the third minus 4 x squared and graph that let's see if we don't get something that looks a little bit like this one. Oh yeah let's see I don't know if you can see that very well let me move it up a little bit you see the similarity in the graph okay on to the next one these are fun 77 another guy good thing I've got one more sheet of scratch paper or of graph paper I should say 77 g of t is equal to negative one-fourth. I don't like that negative there. It's going to kind of uh, reflect things in the x-axis a little bit. So it's going to be kind of twisted around. We'll get to that when we do the leading coefficient test. See how this t is being squared and this t is being squared? So t squared and a t squared. And when I multiply this out, I'm going to have a t to the fourth. So it's even degree but a negative lead coefficient. Okay, and it's degree four. So degree four typically looks like, like an M or a W. And since it's got a negative lead coefficient, it looks like an M. Okay, so this thing rises, or I shouldn't say rises, falls to the left and to the right. See, I'm using the lead coefficient to kind of get that idea. All right, now I need some zeros. The good news is at least it's factored. Set this equal to zero. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, well, that's not going to give me a zero because that's a constant, but this is going to give me a zero, and this is going to give me So t minus 2 equals zero, or t plus 2 equals zero. Add 2, I get 2 equals 2, t equals 2, subtract 2, t equals negative 2. Now you look back and you say, well, you said it was degree four. We only have two zeros. See the repetition? See the repetition? I got two zeros here, multiplicity two. Two zeros here, multiplicity two. Four zeros. So it's going to do that kind of tangent thing. I'll bet you a quarter that it's going to probably look something like that with the x-axis. But we'll see here in just a minute. So we need some points. So I got two and negative two here. This is going to be a hassle because of that fraction there, x and y. So I'm going to plug in negative 3, negative 1, 0, 1, and 3, and hope that that gives me a good enough view of what's going on. Here we go. Plug negative 3 into here. I'll get to this last. Negative 3 minus 2 is negative 5, squared is 25. 25 times negative 3 plus 2 is negative 1 squared is 1. 25 times 1 is 25 times negative 1 fourth is negative 25 fourths, which is like negative 6 and 1 fourth. Now, I know I did most of that in my head, but all I'm doing is plugging negative 3 in here and here and then figuring it out. You can do that on scratch paper or on the calculator. Plug negative 1 in. Negative 1 minus 2 is negative 3. Negative 3 squared is 9. There's a 9 here. Negative 1 plus 2 is 1. 1 squared is 1. So 9 times 1 is 9 times negative 1 fourth 
is negative 9 fourths, which is like negative 2 and 1 fourth. Plug 0 in. 0 minus 2 is negative 2 squared is 4. 0 plus 2 is 2. 2 squared is 4. 4 times 4 is 16. Take 1 fourth of 16, that would be negative 1 fourth times 16, that'd be negative 16 fourths or negative 4. Plug 1 in. I bet you I have some symmetry here because of the uh, even powers here. So if I plug 1 in, 1 minus 2 is negative 1, negative 1 squared is 1. 1 plus 2 is 3, 3 squared is 9, so I have 1 times 9 is 9 times negative 1 fourth is negative 9 fourths. And I'll bet you a dollar that if I plug 3 in, I get negative 6 and a fourth. 3 minus 2 is 1, 1 squared is 1, 3 plus 2 is 5, 5 squared is 25, times 1 is 25, that would be negative 25 fourths, which is negative, two, or negative 6 and 1 fourth. So now I grab a piece of graph paper, and I'm going to graph this thing best I can using this information. It's going to look like an upside down or like, a, like an M, an inverted W, almost said upside down M. And most of my Y values are negative, so I'm going to make it a little longer here in the negative Y values. Here's one, here's uh, one here. So I have zeros at two and negative two. At negative 3, I'm at negative 6 and 1 fourth. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 and 1 fourth. It'd be just a little bit past it there. At negative 1, I'm at negative 2 and 1 fourth. At 0, I'm at negative 4. At 1, I'm at 2 and 1 fourth. And then at 3, I'm at 6 and 1 fourth. Do you see the M? Now you don't just connect the dots and make it look like a capital M. You got to make it look like a curve. You know, round it a little bit there. See how I kind of make it rounded, whether it's hitting the top or hitting the bottom? Oh, that's kind of bad there. Oh, I can do better than that. Maybe I need to get my red pencil here. Can you see that? Oh, you can't see that. There. Now you can see it. All right. One more to go. And this last one has got a little bit of stuff to it. I kind of read through it just to see what was going on. Let me get another piece of paper here. This is 95. It's a story problem. Now, this is much easier done with calculus. You just don't know the calculus yet. Fortunately, they do give us some information. They give us the uh, the width and the height. Now look right here. Let's see if I can show you this with a piece of paper. There, here's a piece of paper I'm not using. All right, this is. Do I have scissors? I bet I don't have. Oh, I do. Nice. So they've got a square box. I'm going to try to make this piece of paper look like a square instead of a rectangle. There it is. Square box. It still looks like a. Well, it's and it's white, so it's hard to tell what it is. Okay. But what they do is they cut out the corners of a certain dimension. They don't tell us what that is. I think that's the part that we have to find. But the corners are all squares and they're all congruent. So I don't know if I can see what I'm doing. I'm cutting out the corners. I'm cutting out the corners here. And so I get something that looks like this. Then they bend up the sides. And I know it's hard to see 3D, but hopefully you can see that I have an open top box. Like It looks like a pan almost. Maybe I can put the corners in there. There we go. They can hold the corners of the paper. And what we're going to do here is we're going to find the dimensions based on the idea we don't know how big the, the piece of uh, paper from the corner, the piece of tin or whatever the material is. It just says material. So let's say, that that, uh, let's say that that square I cut out is x by x. All right, so that means this square, which came out of here, 
This is x and this is x. Right? So it's x high. Can you see that? The height of the box when I bend up the sides is x high. Now, according to the original problem, it was made out of 36 centimeters to a side. So from here to here, it's 36. From here to here, it's 36. And I just cut out an x here and an x here. So that means that this part isn't quite 36. All of this is 36. This is 36 minus this x minus this x. This is 36 minus 2x. And so is this side. This is oop, 36 minus 2x. So we're going to find the volume of this, which is the volume of a solid like this, is length times width times height. So let me write that down. The volume of this open top box is length times width times height. Now I just said that the length and the width were both 36 minus 2x. The height is x. So this is 36 minus 2x, and this is 36 minus 2x, and this is x. So that's my volume right there, which I think I have to have. No, actually, they give you this in part C. They just put the x in front, and they write this with an exponent, 36 minus 2x quantity squared. There's your volume. Okay? They call it V of x, because everything's in terms of x. x is the, the corner... Uh, piece that was cut out uh, and it was a square so each side is x there. Now what they want us to do to begin with in part A is to complete four rows of the table like the one below. So here's the table. They have three columns. They have height which is your x. They have width which is this distance across here, that's 36 minus 2x. This is x. This is 36 minus 2x. And then they have the volume, which is x times 36 minus 2x squared. So they, uh, they give you some numbers here. They start out with a 1 and a 2. Well, they want you to make four rows like the one complete. So I don't know if they want you uh, going to allow you to use 1 and 2. I would say use 3, 4, 5, and 6. If I put 3 in here, this is 36 minus 2 times 3. This is 30. So this would be 3 times 30 squared. That's 30 squared is 900. 3 times 900 is 2,700. Then I plug 4 in. Now, I'm not actually showing you the work. They probably want you to do that. So if I put 4 in here, this would be 36 minus 2 times 4. That's 36 minus 8, that's 28. And then this would be, the volume would be uh, 4 times 36 minus 2 times 4 squared. So that's 4 times 28 squared. Let me grab my calculator here. 28 squared times 4. I get 3136. Okay. Got a bigger volume this time. Now I try 5. If I put 5 in for the height, this would be 36 minus 2 times 5. That would be 36 minus 10. That's 26. So this would be 5 times 36 minus 2 times 5 squared. So that's 26 squared, which I believe is 26 squared. 626? No, not even close. No, 620. 676. Yikes. Times 5. <coughs> 80. So it looks like the bigger my height, uh, the bigger my volume. But eventually that's going to change because eventually if you make it taller and taller and taller, the base gets smaller and smaller. And so you get a real skinny looking uh, rectangular prism and it's not going to hold as much. So 6, that'd be uh, 36 minus 2 times 6, that's 36 minus 12 is 24. 6 times 36 minus 2 times 6 squared. So 24 squared, I think, is 576. Let me check to make sure. <coughs> it is times 6. I get 34, 56. 
And again, it looks like it's getting bigger, but it, and it is, but it's getting bigger by smaller amounts. I mean, if I was to use 10, see, that would be 16 <coughs> squared is 256 times 10 is 2560. It would be smaller. So I believe this is just to show you that the volume is going to increase for a while. And then eventually, if you keep making the height bigger and bigger and bigger, the volume starts to decrease. So what does it say here? It says, use a graphing utility to generate additional rows. Well, I'm hoping that the teacher showed you how to do that because I don't remember how to set up the table. So you're going to have to Google that and do a YouTube video on that if you want to see somebody set up the table like that so you can continue this so you can see the pattern. And then it says, use the table to estimate a range of dimensions from which the maximum volume is produced. Well, in this case, the range of uh, values kind of depends on what you're plugging in. I mean, I, I plugged in from, uh, from 3 to 6, and I went from 2,700 to um, 3,456. So if you can continue this and such. As it turns out, I cheated and looked in the back of the book. If you plug in 7, you get 3,388, and you can see it starts to get smaller. So I think what they want you to do in here, as far as a range is concerned, is they want you to, which, which X values, they want you to keep it probably between 5 and 7. Because that's where it seems like, well, hang on a second, 5 and 7, 5 and 7 here. Because that's where it seems like my answer, my bigger answer is somewhere in between, when X is between 5 and 7. So that's for part B. That's a little stinky for them to ask it that way. But again, it's based on being able to create the table on your calculator. Now it says verify that the volume of the box is this, which we already did, kind of, and it says determine the domain. Well, the problem here as far as the domain is, the distance across on the original piece of paper that I cut up, this was 36 by 36. Was this inches or centimeters here? This was centimeters. Oops, centimeters. Okay, I'm cutting out an equal size corner, so I can't go to halfway, which would be an 18, because if I go to halfway, then I'm going to cut out the four squares, and there goes my whole sheet of paper. So in this case, my X for the domain is going to have to be between 0 and 18. I, it's got to be bigger than 0, otherwise I'm not cutting a corner out. <coughs> but it's got to be smaller than 18, because if I hit 18, I don't have any paper left either. So there's your domain. Then it says use the graphing utility to graph B. Okay, now that was the one I think I had put on here. Maybe I didn't. We'll find out here in a second. I think maybe I did not. Let's see. Y equals. No, I'm going to have to clear that out. Clear that one out. Let's go back. Let's graph X times the quantity 36 minus 2X quantity raised to the second power. And let's see what the graph looks like. I may have to blow this up a little bit. Well, that was no good. I didn't get a graph. Maybe I hit it wrong. No, that looks right. Let me try the graph again. Heavens to Murgatroyd. Maybe my graph is not tall enough. Because these are big numbers here. We're going to have to change this. Let me go to my window. I think my X is okay, but I don't think I need to go from negative 10. I'll go from negative 1 to positive 10 by 1s. But I'm going to go from, yeah, I just have a little bit of a negative. But I got to go up to, I'm going to go up to 3,500. And I'm going to go by jumps of 500. Now let's see what that graph looks like. Hopefully you can see that. I probably took it off the screen and you couldn't see it. Now let's see what that graph looks like. There it is. Look at that beast. You can see here that up here is where it peaks. So if I use the trace, and you see the cursor blinking, I'll move it along until I get to the top. Now look at my Y values. I want the biggest one I can get here. Okay. The X is the, uh, the length of the corner of the square that I cut out, but this is going to be my volume here. So as I get closer and closer to the top, to the apex, it looks like it's pretty close. 
I'm at 34.55, and you can see I'm at about six. So maybe six, 34.55, yeah. Because this is a little bit bigger than six. At six, it was 34.56, which is just uh, a hair bigger than this one, because this is almost uh, 34.56. So based on that, for part D, it says, um, find the X value. I'm going to say X is 6. And find the maximum volume. X equals 6. V of 6 turned out to be 3456 cubic centimeters. Now, I'm hoping that he has this one as extra credit because this one's a peach. All right, I don't know how many of my pre-calc students would be able to tackle that one. So anyway, that's the way it works. You can be more than welcome to ask me questions about it, but you can see how much writing it takes. So answering something over the phone might take a little bit of, of doing. Uh, so anyway, it's not due till Monday. You give it a shot, and then if nothing else, maybe sometime over the weekend, if you have a question, I can look at your paper and see what's going on. But make sure you try the problems before, of course, you uh, watch this video. Of course, I should have said that at the beginning of the video. Because it's always good to practice, practice, practice.